want to thank everyone for joining us for the 2021 Big Ten Football Championship Game Coach Zub webinar. Uh, as a reminder, this call is being recorded and we will distribute the recording after its conclusion and also post the recording to big10.org. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, today's call is going to feature both head coaches. We're going to lead off with Iowa head coach Kirk Ferentz, um, and then we'll lead into Jim Harbaugh later in the call. Uh, individuals wishing to, wishing to ask a question should raise their hand in the chat. Uh, we'll call on you on the back end and temporarily provide you with the mic to ask your question. Um, and again, as a reminder, we'll distribute this after its conclusion. If you do not receive the recording, please certainly reach out to us and we'll make sure that you get a copy. Um, so first, we're going to lead off with Iowa coach Kirk Ferentz. Um, Kirk and uh, the Hawkeyes finished the regular season with a 10-2 overall record and 7-2 in conference play. They'll be making their second appearance in the Big Ten football championship game and captured their second West Division title. A victory on Saturday would give the Hawkeyes their 12th Big Ten championship. Uh, coach, thanks for joining us. I'll throw it to you for some opening comments, and then we'll open it up to the media for questions. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, so, you know, certainly it's been a special season for us, and this is a really special team. Uh, you know, I think one thing uh, good about experience maybe is you, you get a little bit of a vantage point. And uh, one thing about this team, it's, it's clearly a group of players and coaches that really uh, like each other, they trust each other, and, and they've worked through adversity together. So, it's been really uh, fun to be part of this, and uh, you know we're just really excited to have the opportunity to keep playing uh, to play an opponent like Michigan. Is you know it's a great uh, great thrill for us, and I know we're the unexpected opponent, but uh, we really look forward to the challenge uh, that's in front of us this week. And I'll throw it out for questions. Great, thank you, Coach. Uh, we'll take our first question from Scott Dockerman. Yeah, hi, Kirk. How are you? Good, Scott. Good. Wanted to ask you about. Um, about quarterback. Um, after getting a chance to evaluate the game the other day, uh, Alex in the first half, Spencer in the second half, what did you come away from? And maybe who do you have an early decision made already for who will start on Saturday night? Yeah, I said it kind of jokingly on Friday, but uh, we'll probably announce that on Tuesday. But uh, really, overall, I've been pleased with both guys. I think both of them have, have really performed well during the course of the year. Uh, I've seen improvement with both guys, and uh, you know we go into this week feeling good about, about our situation there. We'll take our next question from Brian Teague. Hi, Kurt. How, how are you doing today? Good, Brian. All right, congrats on the uh, division title. Thank you. So you spoke on the adversity of the season. How do you feel this adversity that your team has faced this season is preparing you for the matchup against Michigan on Saturday? Well, you know, it seems like every time we go to a bowl game or a game like this, we're underdogs. We're a little bit used to that. Um, and, you know, one thing I tell our team every August is every season is going to bring its set of challenges. It's going to have opportunity, but also uh, its set of challenges. And, and one thing in August, you never know what those challenges are going to be, how they're going to present themselves. So we, we've had them in individual games. We've had them through injury. We've had them through illness. Uh, last week, a lot of guys sick with the flu and uh, I mean, you go right down the line and, and we're not unique. I mean, everybody in football pretty much goes through that. If you play a 12 game schedule in a conference like the big 10. So it's just, it's part of it. Uh, the part that's been, been fun for me is to watch the guys uh, pull together and try to work through uh, whatever challenges have presented themselves. And, you know, you got challenges within every game and then also within the seasons and then part, parts of the season uh, as well. So uh, there's a lot of moving parts during the course of a football season I think that's one of the things that makes it so exciting. That's probably why fans uh, enjoy it as much as they do. And certainly for uh, those of us that are involved as players or coaches, I think that's that's really what makes it so unique. And you just constantly learn about your team. And, uh, you know, just really proud of our guys, the way they've handled every step of the way. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Alex Webke. Uh, Coach, congratulations on the season. I just Thank want you. to ask you, um, how do you compare this team to similarities and differences uh, between the 2015 team that last went to the title and, and this team here? You know, the 15 team was really interesting uh, in that we didn't have much star power. Uh, our highest ranked senior that year, uh, we had a great group of seniors. Uh, the highest ranked guy NFL wise was Austin Blythe. He got drafted in the seventh round by the Rams and uh, continues to have a really nice career in the NFL. But 
my point there, and I think there are some parallels. We don't have a huge senior class that that team didn't either, but the, the seniors are totally invested and they really set the tempo for the younger guys uh, and did a great job of that. And, and I think, you know, when you look at a team, leadership always starts at the top with those older players. And in our case, you know, we got a lot of guys that are juniors also that have played and played a lot. They, 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 uh, they've they been great as well. And we've got a real big gap, um, you know, down to younger guys and that, came apparent to me last spring. I think we had 70 guys. Uh, it was our first spring practice. You think about last year being the pandemic year. And then, you know, this year back to normal, so to speak. So, you know, just, it was apparent to me that we had a real gap that we had 30 guys that have been around a little bit and then 70 that really are, are really new to this. And, um, you know, so those older guys have really set the tone. So I think the one commonality there is that, um, you know, we've gotten great leadership from our older players. And then most importantly, the younger guys have, follow their lead and uh, tried to do do things the way those guys do them. And it's, uh, it's a pretty good deal that way. So, and the chemistry has been really great. As I alluded to in my opening comments, uh, this team is truly together. They're, they're really together. And, uh, you know, that, that 15 team was too. But I, I, I'm guessing, you know, usually when you find a team in a championship game, uh, that, that's going to be an attribute or, a, a, you know, a characteristic you'll find probably pretty commonly with, with good teams. We'll take our next question from Chad Lestico. Hey, good afternoon, Kirk. Great to see you. Likewise, Chad. Uh, you know, we've never been through anything like this before. We were waiting on help, you know, to get in the Big Ten Championship game. And we know that you said you kind of ride with the emotions of games sometimes. <laughs> Just curious if you could paint the picture of what your situation was yesterday. Were you watching at home with family, you know, in the office, getting ready to prepare? And kind of just what were your emotions as you saw the Minnesota game play out? Yeah, so a couple things. Uh, and I don't know anything about gambling, but I'm guessing if you'd put some money on us when it was 21 to 6 the other day, uh, and you probably done okay. I don't know how much I'd pay off, but uh, anyway, so yeah, it's, it's been been quite a journey here the last couple of days. Uh, and what I said Friday really was true yesterday. I uh, did watch the game, obviously. We had uh, family over. We celebrated Thanksgiving yesterday. Uh, so we had the game on, and, and uh, I was trying not to get too sucked in emotionally to it. Uh, pretty clear what, what outcome we were cheering for, but, um, yeah, you just kind of let the game play out. And then, it, you know, as the game went on, it became apparent that, you know, maybe this would be a reality. And, um, you know, when the final whistle went off, it was a really good feeling for us and just really happy for our players, everybody involved, uh, you know, the staff, um, you know, to have an opportunity to play in a championship game is always special. And, uh, you know, we certainly took the hard road to get there. So, you know, it was, it was a really good feeling. And then, you know, as you might imagine, the phone blows up after that uh, thing started there. But um, no, so we just, uh, we came in this morning, we got to work and we'll handle this like a normal game week and try to be the same way with our players. We'll take our next question from John Steppy. Hi, Kirk. Good afternoon. Hey, John. What's the status of the flu bug? Is that still something affecting the team? Hopefully not. Uh, we'll, we'll learn more. The guys are coming in right now, actually. So I'll learn more here in the next hour or two. But um, prelim reports are really good. Hopefully uh, it's run its course, or at least we're on the on the tail end of it. And made for an interesting week, to say the least. But, uh, you yeah, know, hopefully we're coming out of it. We'll take the next question from Andrew Kahn. Hey, Kirk, I'm, I'm wondering if you could... Uh you know, speak to your relationship with, with Jim Harbaugh and, you know, as, as the longest tenured coach in, in FBS, uh, you know, any, any thoughts on Michigan, I mean, you know, stick, sticking with him, you know, in a lot of schools, sometimes they want to make changes, but, you know, after six years, they, they decided to, you know, stay with them. And now here they are playing you guys for, for a championship. I mean, yeah, you want to talk about old school. That's an old school approach uh, to actually stick with the coach coaches, you know, and uh, credit to them, credit to their administration, uh, their leadership there. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to, uh, you know, I was on the sidelines when Jim was playing. Uh, same with Phil Parker on our staff, you know, back in the 80s. And those guys were both uh, outstanding players at their respective schools. So I remember Jim as a competitor. Uh, and obviously, you know, they had a really good football team in 85. And uh, it's one of the, you know, great games in our history here uh, playing against them. Just it was a tremendous football game. And Jim was right in the middle of that, made a key play for a touchdown, shoveled the ball off. I think it was to Perry. But anyway, that didn't. Yeah, I remember that. And then I actually worked with Jim uh, in Baltimore uh, later in his career, uh, my career also before coming back. But uh, yeah, Jim's a great, great person uh, from my vantage point and outstanding coach. And 
again, a lot of credit to the administration, uh, at Michigan for, you know, uh, you know, just sticking with the, uh, the path and the course and uh, letting things play out. And uh, those guys really played outstanding football all season long this year. Thanks. Next, we'll go to Tom Kaker. Kirk, how you doing? Good, Tom. How about you? Doing well. Um, just wondered if you watched Michigan Ohio State yesterday while you were uh, preparing the turkey and stuff, and what you thought of that game, and um, and just what that was, what you saw. They're kind of more of an old school, traditional Big Ten team. Yeah. Well, just for the record, uh, certainly I didn't prepare. I don't. I don't prepare turkey. I eat it uh, gladly, but I'm not much help uh, other than scrambled eggs in the kitchen or grilling something on the grill. But uh, it was a good meal nonetheless, and you know, good day for everybody. Uh, I, I watched yeah, both those games yesterday, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a great football game. Uh, you know, classic Big Ten weather with the snow coming down and uh, two, two really good teams slugging it out and getting after it and uh, great crowd involvement. So it's every, everything that's good about the Big Ten, I think, certainly showed up in both games, actually. Uh, but yeah, Michigan played yesterday the way they've been playing, at least on the film we've seen during the course of the year, played the way they've been playing all season long. Uh, they, they're good up front, both sides of the ball. Uh, they run the ball really effectively and throw it effectively and uh, present a lot of challenges for you uh, as you're a defensive team looking at it. And then offensively, uh, you know, they're playing good defense like you'd always expect. That's just kind of a tradition at Michigan. So, and then on top of it, you know, really good special teams guys, uh, special teams play and uh, specialist. So it's, it's, you know, they're a tough team to prepare for. And uh, again, when you get to a championship game, uh, that's it's really what you expect is playing a team that's a complete team, and that's what we see in Michigan. Take our next question from Angelique Chen Gillis. Kirk, just piggybacking on that a little bit, I, I suspect you have not had a chance to watch a lot of Michigan film yet, but what are your early impressions of the run game, uh, Haskins, Corum, and, and now the freshman Donovan Edwards? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, all, all three of those guys are really good. I don't know much as much about Edwards, but uh, – you know, we've been watching film all season long and there's crossover tape. Uh, so when Michigan's one of the opponents, common opponents, they're, they're typically a team we watch uh, because they do run the ball a little bit and they give us an idea maybe what, what the opponent defense might look like. And yeah, both their backs have been stellar, uh, really had great seasons and, you know, they, they both present different challenges. So it's, uh, and they're not the only two guys. I mean, there's other guys involved, obviously. But, but they're getting good play, you know, uh, certainly from the running backs. Uh, the guys, as I mentioned a minute ago, up front, I think they're uh, really doing a nice job. All, all five guys coordinated. They've got good tight ends, quarterbacks playing well, and they got good skill guys outside. So uh, I know they, they've run the ball effectively, but they're, they're not a one-dimensional football team. We'll take our next question from Scott Dockerman. Yeah, Kirk. Uh going back to quarterback a little bit you said the other day it was more of a gut feel at halftime to go back to Spencer I don't know if that was because Alex's gut wasn't effective or what but um, what's kind of do you have a, a, a less uh, gut feel on what how you'll judge and which way you're going to go this week or are there certain markers you want to hit or how would you kind of judge who gets that nod you know, we'll just we'll just keep pushing this thing forward. And, uh, I, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk to our guys. We, we all left uh, Friday, got back here, and everybody went their separate ways. And uh, everybody was out of the building yesterday. So, you know, we just uh, – players aren't back in yet. We'll have a chance to visit with them later on. And uh, then we'll go ahead and, you know, probably say something on Tuesday. I mean, it's not like it's a, um, a great secret. And both guys have played, I think, you know, there are plenty of films. So Michigan's going to look at both guys. I know that. And. It's not like it's uh, we're trying to be coy, but I just want to have an opportunity, I think, to visit with the team and uh, visit with the staff, and then we'll, we'll push forward. We'll go back to Chad Lestico for our next question. Hey, Kirk. Um, I don't think we asked you about this in post game, kind of a minor question, but I noticed uh, Connor Colby went out at one point in the game. Was that performance related? Same thing, Mason Richmond looked like Plum was left tackle on that last drive. Yeah, so, you know, part of it, uh, you know, we've had guys playing hurt all season long, and then on Friday we had a lot of guys affected by the bug. So, you know, it just uh, it was a matter of, you know, how long could guys hang in there, stay stay in there, that type of thing. So just uh, really pleased that uh, both those guys were able to play. And, uh, you know, I thought they both gave great efforts. But, you yeah, know, hopefully, and I, again, I'll know more about this Tuesday, but expect everybody to be full speed. I don't, I don't think we came out of it. With anything significant orthopedically and uh, you know what you can't predict is the flu but 
like I said, I think it, it was tailing off for the most part. Uh, by the end of the week, we had one or two guys that spiked on Friday slash Saturday. Uh, so, you know, really credit to them for going out there and playing that way. And uh, hopefully I didn't give the, give the flu to somebody from the other team, but, you know, we'll see what happens here. Next, we'll go to Luciana Chatelain. Hey, Coach, I hope you're doing well, and thanks for your time. What My were the, pleasure. What were the keys to picking up the morale of your team after those two consecutive losses against Purdue and Wisconsin in order to reach this game? And how hard was it to get out of that slump? It's always hard. You know, anytime you lose a game, um, you know, I know fans get upset. Uh, that, that's, that's part of sports, and we all understand that. But I think, you know, sometimes everybody needs to remember nobody hurts more after a loss than the players. Um, the coaches are probably close second, but the players especially because they have one opportunity to play college football. It's a short window, and, and they invest an awful lot. It, it's uh, really kind of the same discussion when there's a player injured. Uh, you know, it's hard on everybody, but it's really hard on that individual who works so hard for 12 opportunities. And that's all that are, are guaranteed last year. We found out that that's not even, you know, a reality all the time. So uh, it was really difficult. It was a really difficult thing for us to go through. And uh, to, to add to that, we had a bye week in between. So, you know, it almost compounded the, uh, the loss in some ways. And then uh, to come out of our bye and not do, do so well, uh, tough. But, you know, really, really uh, can't say enough about our players. They stayed resilient. Uh, they just kept working, kept trying to improve. And that, that's really all we ask them to do every week is try to improve. Uh, I think they were committed to that. And uh, I think the rest of the story, too, if you look at it, all four of those games following those two losses, uh, you know, there was no walk in the park with any of them. We, we really had to play the full 60 minutes each and every, uh, each and every week. And uh, but we talked to our guys all the time. That, that's why they play 60 minutes, sometimes more, but there's 60 on the clock. So play it out. And it's the same thing with the season. You got a 12 game scheduled. So, um, you know, you feel bad when bad things don't go right. But, uh, you know, the season's not over and let's just keep our focus on the next step. And fortunately, our players really bought into that and just just kept pushing forward. We'll take our next question from Mike Moore. Mike, are you with us? All right, we'll jump ahead and we'll go back to Scott Dockerman for the next one. Kirk, last year you uh, you spent a lot of time preparing for Michigan in that Champions Week matchup. It didn't materialize. Um, can you look at anything that you did uh, work-wise last week or last year, or is Michigan so different now that you just you almost have to throw out any preparation you did a year ago? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually gave that some thought. To, yeah, it's, it's really more the latter. Uh, interesting that we played Illinois, you know, a week ago, 10 days ago, uh, nine days ago, eight, whatever it was, uh, there was carryover from the Missouri bowl game. Uh, the, the work we'd done on their defense, uh, fit, fit a little bit with what, uh, what we saw from Illinois, but in this case, no, I think they're, they're a, a very different football team. Certainly, you know, they're, they've, uh, got a new defensive coordinator and he's done a great job with their, their players and they're really playing at a high level on defense. And then offensively, uh, yeah, I think their attack has changed there too. So. Uh, really, yeah, I'm, I've got a folder, but didn't, didn't even look at it. And the other, other thing about this time of year, you've got a lot of film on this team anyway, so it's it's really a lot more relevant to what we're, we're, we're up against. We'll take our next question from Chad Lestico. Hi, Kirk. I, I want to circle back to your comment earlier about just how these guys like each other. We've seen that. Too. We saw that in social media just pour out yesterday, just how much – passion they had for the Minnesota result I guess can you just I talked to you in August about this you know could they stay together you know all this stuff I guess just how proud are you four months later since we talked in, in media day in August just that they kind of ran the race the right way and, and got here I know it's not really proud yeah, yeah. Really, really proud and it, it's again I'll go back to the point I made earlier it, it all starts with the older guys and um uh, you know they're just totally bought in uh but most importantly they, they believe in each other and care about each other and, you know, it's, we've had our challenges, certainly with injuries. Um, you know, that, that's been unfortunate, but guys uh, stayed positive. I was just talking to Matt Hankins out in the hallway probably about an hour ago, and he's got a great attitude. He's so excited, even though he won't be playing this week, he's so excited to be part of this. And, um, you know, he'll have a real positive effect on a lot of other guys. So that's, that's just kind of how the team's been. And uh, as I alluded to also in some of the earlier comments, you know, they, they've been tested. And it's one thing to, you know, 
all for one, one for all until, you know, the bumps start hitting. And um, that, that's really when you find out, you know, what, what a team uh, is made of, how they, you know, how they really feel and how they're really committed. And uh, it's easy to be committed when things are going well, but you know, these guys have run the entire race. And, um, you know, like I said, we stretch a little bit about as thin as you can here the last 48 hours, but it's, it's paid off. And, uh, you know, we find ourselves right now with a chance to play another game. So, I mean, what else can you ask for? It's just, a, it's a really uh, good feeling for everybody. Take our next question from Jeff Dubroff. Hey, Kirk, congrats on winning the, uh, the division. I wanted to see, there's that great picture that was posted on Twitter of the team holding up Caleb Shudak. And I wanted to see if maybe you could put into words, you know, what his performance over the last two games has meant to you and, potentially where this team might be if he hadn't performed the way he had. Yeah, I missed that picture. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, and our, our local media has heard me talk about Caleb for a couple of years. You know, we had a really good kicker here in Keith Duncan. Um, but I, I said it a year ago uh, during the 19 season, really, you know, if, if you took the uh, shirts or jerseys off the guys, you, you wouldn't know one from the other. Uh, obviously, they look a little different, all that. But uh, as far as performance goes, it was, it was a coin toss. I mean, really was literally, and, and truth be known, if it was a longer field goal, a 35, you know, 35 yard line plus, I probably would have gone with Caleb last year. We just never got in those situations. Um, but can't, can't say enough about the way he's performed, the way he's persevered, uh, in this era of grad transfers, you know, he could have popped out of here and, and gone pretty much anywhere and started. You've seen how he performs, but you know, he's a very unselfish guy. He was our kickoff guy for the last couple of years, did a great job with that. And uh, when Keith step, stepped uh, out due to graduation, you know, he jumped right in there. And uh, I think sometimes we almost take him for granted because he is so consistent and so reliable. So I uh, just can't say enough. And then you talk about, again, leadership, uh, studying influence on younger players. He's just been absolutely outstanding. He's a great mentor for all the younger specialists, but, but a lot of guys on our football team. And I think he's teaching in our engineer in engineering department right now. I mean, he's got about seven degrees here. So he's, he's really an outstanding student, but just a first class young guy. We have time for a few more questions here. We'll go to Angelique Chengelis next. I apologize. I didn't, I did not mean to have my hand raised. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. We'll, uh, we'll jump ahead to, uh, to Brian Teague in that case. All right, Coach, uh, your staff earlier in the season mentioned that they felt like they lost a little bit of that offensive identity. What do you credit for that moving in the right direction here down the stretch? Offensive identity is, I think that's what I heard, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really, our, our challenges really started up front this year. And, uh, you know, we, we've graduated some good players through the last couple of years. We, we knew we'd be young at tackle, but I think all of us were, uh, you know, figuring we'd be pretty veteran inside. Uh, Tyler Linderbaum is as good a lineman as I've ever worked with at any level. Uh, he's just a first-class guy and an outstanding football player. And then we thought we had two pretty uh, veteran guards in Kyle Shot and uh, Cody Entz. But unfortunately, really, uh, Kyler and Cody, you know, two different stories. Cody's been – he had surgery back in January and uh, really hasn't been able to get to full speed. I think he's close now, but uh, it took him a long time to get traction coming back and faced a couple hurdles with other injuries. And then uh, Kyler was doing fine. And uh, unfortunately, during the break between the end of summer program and the start of camp, um, broke a bone in his foot. So he missed, I don't know, six, eight weeks. And then, you know, came back after sitting all that time and tried to play his way back into shape. So he's finally back in game form right now. Uh, but my point is, you know, early in the season, we pretty much had Tyler and then four guys that haven't played a lot uh, in their plan. And they're all good young guys, and they're all guys that uh, I think have improved. And I said that back in September. I thought the, uh, uh, the the opportunity for growth and improvement in that position and probably our defensive line was was maybe as big as anything on our football team because we're so young in both areas and so inexperienced. But I think we're finally seeing that. I thought, you know, we started to gain a little traction maybe after the bye week and with each week. I think we've improved here uh, this last four-game block. So, yeah, we're, we're hardly monsters of the midway yet, but uh, I think we're closer to being able to operate. And it's going to be a big challenge Saturday because Michigan's got a really good front, I think, as all you guys know. Um, and it's not just a one-man show, although that one man is, is an unbelievable football player. Uh, but they, they've got a good group of guys on defense. So it, it's not going to be an easy challenge, but you know, it'll be a great test. And we'll see, see if we can grow more this week. We'll take our next question from John Steppy. 
kind of going off that with the defensive pressure at Michigan can force, what challenges do you see that posing considering the youth at the two tackle positions as they deal with Michigan's edge rushers? Yeah. So I, I was just watching uh, some of that game uh, before I came in here and uh, you know, all you had to do is watch a game yesterday. No, that was a huge part of the game out there. And, you know, Ohio State's got a veteran group of guys up there. Those guys are really good. And so that just speaks to the uh, tenacity of the, the edge guys for Michigan. And uh, number 97 is just, he's an outstanding player. I'm sitting in my office thinking about, you know, guys that we faced too. He reminds me of, and I, I can just say my six years, I'll date myself, my six years in the NFL. You, know, you play against good guys each and every week. Uh, and there are a lot of really good players in the National Football League. But during my time, the two that really stood out, uh, Reggie White was just such a freak. I mean, and a freak person. I'm, I'm not including him. He's on a different planet. But you think about a guy like Howie Long or think about a guy like John Randall. And during my time in the, the National Football League, those two guys were as, as problematic as anybody you faced, mainly because they just didn't take plays off. Like it was just all the time, every play. And that sounds, you know, routine, like that's what you're supposed to do. But not all players can do that. And uh, those two guys, when I was coaching, uh, they kept you up at night just worried about, like, boy, how they're going to disrupt things. And I think that's what you're looking at with 97. J.J. Watt's probably more, you know, moving into the, this century. Uh, J.J. Watt's that kind of guy in the NFL or, you know, when he was in his prime. So, uh, yeah, 97 is just a really disruptive player. And it's mainly because he's just got – he's a good football player. He's, you know, elusive. He's strong. But he's also just got such a tremendous motor. We have time for two more questions. We'll take our next question from Steve Clark, and then we'll end with Scott Dockerman. Steve, are you there? All right, we'll just jump ahead to Scott Dockerman, and then we'll wrap it up and bring on Coach Harbaugh. Yeah, Kirk, I uh, wanted to ask you about your team's composure. I mean, you lost a touchdown on a kind of a controversial call. Fumble inside the 10, you're down 15 points with uh, 30 seconds left in the third quarter. Plus the week before, you're even down 10 points after the uh, early in the game. How has your team been able to kind of maintain that composure, even amid all the injuries and adversities and quarterback changes and, and what have you? Yeah, you know, I said Friday, uh, as you might imagine, I'm, I'm not a real big fan of our replay system right now, you know, and I, this, this is not the time or place, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it seems like it's really lost its way a little bit, and it affected the game, I thought, the other day. Uh, it is what it is. So, you know, but the bottom line is whether it's at a turnover, you know, nobody wants those things to happen, as I alluded to earlier, uh, like, like nobody's intentionally dropping a ball or letting it out. Sometimes those things happen, and I think really um, – you know, you're trying to coach against those things all the time, but things happen in the course of a game. And it gets back to, you know, guys believe in each other a little bit. And it's like anything in life, right? You can't, uh, you, you try to avoid things. You try to coach proactively. But when th bad things do happen, you just got to move on. You got to put it behind you, you know, analyze it real quickly. It's like a loss. You analyze it, learn from it, but then you got to move on. And the longer you dwell on it, the, the worse things are probably going to get. So, you know, the call was whatever it was, and uh, same thing with the turnover. And, you know, all we could do is keep playing, and then you got to find another way to, you know, to get that spark play. A week ago, it was a kick return after uh, we get, we fall behind 10 nothing, And, you know, yesterday it was uh, that pump block ended up really sparking us. And, um, you know, so two days ago. <clears throat> so, you know, you just got to keep playing and believe somebody's going to find find a way to do something uh, to help help, you know, get us back on track and, uh, again, as I said earlier, that's why you play a game 60 minutes, you know, no sense worrying about what's going wrong. Let's just keep playing and see what happens. And, you know, it's uh, at least in this case served us well. And, you know, now we got to try to find a way to uh, to do it one more time. It won't be easy, but it's, you know, that's the fun of this all is, you know, knowing we got a big challenge in our hands and see if we can get ready for it. And then, you know, most importantly, go out and compete at a really high level because it's going to take each each and every bit of that to to have a chance against Michigan Saturday. Coach, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you down in Indianapolis next week. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder to Iowa media and attendance, I will hold their normal press conferences on Tuesday with student athletes uh, made available at 11 a.m. Central and coach being made available at 1.30 a.m. Central. Uh, coach's press conference.